Good afternoon, everybody. I hope you are doing well. It is uh, late in the afternoon, almost evening time, a few hours away from the conclusion of the fast of Tisha B'Av. We are, we see the end. This is often for many more difficult parts of the fast because you know you're almost there and uh, the, the clock seems to be ticking slower. So I figured it would be at this time that I share some words of Chizuk, some words of inspiration that I received the other day by a big tzaddik, the tzaddik of Elimelech Bitterman, who uh, speaks to thousands. Um, and he, weekly he sends out some words of, uh, of Chizuk and Torah. And I want to focus on tefillah. I want to focus on prayer. Because in the end of the day, that's what we need. We need to pray. We need to pray for the Geula. We need to pray for Mashiach. There's a lot of things that we have to pray for besides for our own personal tefillot and requests of health and sustenance. But we need we need a communal. We need a communal Geula. We need a communal Yeshua salvation. You know, both Batei Mikdash were destroyed because of lack of tefillot. The Ya'arot Devash teaches that the first Bet HaMikdash was destroyed because people weren't accustomed to turning to God to pray. They just weren't accustomed. They had a problem. You know, they figured, okay, go away. Never did it cross their mind. Maybe I'll look up to Shamaim and ask him. David HaMelech says in Tehilim, Hashem lo karau. They didn't pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. We read this morning and last night in Megillat Echa, V'dim'ata al lehaya, the tears were on her cheek. And here the Yarot Tevash explains, Dim'ata, Dim'ata, her tears were bitter tears that were shed by the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash were because of lehaya. The Dim'ata, the tears were because of lehaya. The Gemara Masechet Chulin writes that lehaya, cheeks, means tefillah, because the cheeks move, the mouth moves whenever a person recites prayer. So the bitter churban, the bitter tears that came as a result of the churban was alehaya, because the people weren't praying. The Midrash, the Midrash tells us that when the Jewish nation went into exile and they were standing on the rivers of Babylon, Al Naharot Babel, Yirmiyahu left them. He deserted them, wanted nothing to do with them. And everyone began to cry bitterly. They screamed out to Yirmiyahu and they said, Yirmiyahu, Rabenu, are you going to leave us? You're going to leave us here on the on the banks of the river? And Yirmiyahu told them, I testify by heaven and earth, says the Midrash, that if you just cried once, if you prayed once while you were still living in Yerushalayim, you wouldn't have been sent into exile. And their cries and prayers we see from here could have had an effect a serious effect to stop the Galut and the destruction of the Bet HaMikdash, but they cried out too late. In the Midrash of Echa, there is a fascinating um, anecdote between the evil Nebuchadnezzar, the one in charge of the destruction, the leader of the uh, Babylonians, and Nebuzaradan, who was the general. And Nebuchadnezzar told Nebuzaradan, the following, you should know that the Jewish people's God accepts their repentance and accepts their prayers. And if they were to pray, God will save them. Therefore, therefore, when driving them out of their land, don't let them stop walking. Let them continue to move constantly. Even for a moment, don't let them stop walking. Because if they have one split second to walk, to stop, they will call out to Hashem in prayer, and we're, de- we're doomed. We're finished. So Nebuzaradan followed Nebuchadnezzar's advice, and when he brought the nation into exile, he didn't let them rest in order to prevent them from praying. And his soldiers were commanded to amputate the limbs of anyone who stopped walking along. Reminds me, of the death march at the times of the conclusion of World War II. Once in uh, concentration camps were liberated, history tells us that the Nazis, not willing to 
let the Jewish prisoners and all the prisoners go. They sent them on this death march in bitter cold. It was in the middle of January. And anyway, they just walked and walked for miles and miles and miles already. Very skinny, without much nourishment. And we know anyone that couldn't walk was shot on the spot. And uh, this is, in, in a way, what Nebuchadnezzar and Nebuchadnezzar are doing over here. A more spiritual aspect. If, they, if they're stopping, you kill them. You amputate them. Why? Because they can't, they can't pray. Because then we're finished. So we see that even Nebuchadnezzar Arasha understood that the Jews have the power to thwart their exile through the tefillah. The second Bet Amidash was also destroyed because the Jewish people didn't pray. And, 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 and they had the opportunity to do so. Chachamim tell us that when the first Bet Amidash was destroyed, it was Erev Tisha Be'av. It was Motzei Shabbat. The Leviim were singing their songs, the Shirim. And they got up to the words, Yatzmitem Adonai Elohenu, which means Hashem will demolish them, the enemies of the Jewish nation. But they didn't get to those words. They got to the words, but they didn't recite them yet. And that moment, the Gentiles seized the temple, the Bet HaMikdash, and the same thing happened by the second Bet HaMikdash. So what does he see? If the Levim had recited the words, Yatzmitem Hashem Elokeinu, Hashem will demolish our enemies, a two Batei Mikdash wouldn't be destroyed. The Tfilot would have prevented the Churban. Many of us are familiar with the story of Kamsa and Bar Kamsa, the infamous story in Masechet Gitin, which ultimately led to the Romans destroying the Bet HaMikdash, Gitin Mas, uh, Daf, Daf Nun Vav. The beginning of the story is that Bar Kamsa tried to convince the Roman king once he was kicked out of Kamsa's house. Bar Kamsa tried convincing the Roman king that the Jewish people were rebelling. And he advised the king to send a korban to Jerusalem to see whether or not they're going to sacrifice this, knowing that the Jewish people were not going to sacrifice the the, the korban of a non-Jew. And he told them, if they don't sacrifice, it, for sacrifice, that's your proof that they're rebelling against you. So the king sent an ox to be offered as a korban. On the way to Yerushalayim, what did Bar Kamsa do? He mutilated the ox's lip, or some say he maimed its eye, which made the ox unsuitable to be brought as a korban. It now contained a mum. Anything that has a blemish, any korban that has a blemish, cannot be offered in the Bet HaMikdash. So the Chachamim that were, in the time, that were living in the time of the Bet HaMikdash thought, even though it has a blemish, they know it came from the Roman uh, emperor, the Roman king. So he's, nevertheless, he said, let's offer it. We need to offer it, regardless of the moon. Why? Because pikuach nefesh. It's a matter of life and death. And the entire Jewish community were at, were at risk if they didn't sacrifice it. Along came a tzaddik whose name was Rav Zechariah ben Avkulas. And the, the Gemara tells us that Rav Zechariah ben Avkulas disagreed. And he said, if you allow this korban, people will say it's permitted to sacrifice a korban with a mum, with a blemish. Despite the danger involved, he recommended that they shouldn't sacrifice the korban so that the halachot, so that the laws of the Torah shouldn't be forgotten. So Chachamim came up with another idea. Again, they're worried for their lives. They said, let's go kill Bar Kamsa so that he won't tattle on them. If we kill Bar Kamsa, we won't sacrifice the, the animal, but we'll kill Bar Kamsa, and he won't tell the Roman emperor what happened. So once again, Rav Zechariah ben Avkulas vetoed the plan, and he explained, if we kill Bar Kamsa, then what are people going to say? People will think that whoever makes a mum, whoever makes a blemish on an animal, on a korban, is killed. So Chachamim accepted Rav Zechariah's rulings, and the korban wasn't sacrificed, Bar Kamsa wasn't killed. Bar Kamsa reported the incident to the Roman king and that led to the Hurban. As a result of this story, Rabbi Yohanan concludes, Anvatnuto shod Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulas sarfa et hechalenu vehegla otanu me'artzenu. That the humility of Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulas destroyed our house, burned our hechal, and exiled us from our land. The Mefarshim on this Gemara wonder in astonishment. Number one, was it really that 
it was this rabbi's humility that caused the destruction? It seems that it was his caution. He had extreme caution. He was worried that, you know, that's what caused it. Why does Rabbi Yochanan attribute the Khurban to Rabbi Zechariah's humility? Question one. Question two. What exactly was Rav Zechariah's logic? It was a situation of pikuach nefesh, life and death. You're probably having the same question. The halacha is that one has to transgress the entire Torah to save a Jewish person's life. They should have offered the korban or killed Bar Kamsa to save the Jewish nation. Why was Rav Zechariah ben Avkula so concerned about the halachot being forgotten, the Torah being forgotten when the lives of so many Jews were at stake? So the Chachamim answer that Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkulas was the Gadol Ador. He was the leader of the generation. How do we know that? The proof is because all the other scholars immediately accepted his opinion. Whatever he said, they agreed. He also had Ruach HaKodesh. And he knew with his Ruach HaKodesh that the Churban was imminent. The time had come for the Bet HaMikdash to be destroyed. It was decreed in heaven. And he understood through Ruach HaKodesh, that nothing could be done to change the decree. So Rav Zechariah figured, at this point, they might as well protect the halachot, because the Churban is going to happen regardless. At least the halachot of the Torah won't be forgotten. So the Meor and Aim on this Gemara takes this one step further, and says, why didn't Rav Zechariah ben Avkulas tell the Chachamim openly what he saw by Ruach HaKodesh? Could have just told him straight away, I saw Baruch HaKodesh, the Bet HaMikdash is going to be destroyed. He should have said to him, you're right, it's Pikuach Nefesh, I know the entire nation's at risk, I know really we should offer the Korban or maybe kill Bar Kamsa. But Baruch HaKodesh, I know that the Korban is going to come, so therefore let's at least hold Alachot. Why didn't he tell them that? So the answer is, Rav Zechariah was humble, and he didn't want to tell them that he had Baruch HaKodesh. So this is the meaning of Rabbi Yochanan's statement. The humility of Rabbi Zechariah ben Avkilus destroyed the Bet HaMikdash and the Echal. For if it weren't for his humility, he would have re- revealed to them the Churban, they would have prayed, they would have done Teshuvah, they would have beseeched HaKadosh Baruch Hu to have compassion on them. And the decree would have been rescinded. And therefore, it was that humility that caused the destruction that he didn't want to reveal is Ruach HaKodesh. In conclusion, what do we see? We see that the Jewish people have the ability to annul the decree of the Churban with their Tefilot and Teshubah. Had Rabbi Zechariah actually revealed to them the Churban, that the Churban was imminent, they would have done so. We have the power of Tefilah. And when, when we pray and we beseech Hashem, HaKadosh Baruch Hu hears us and answers us. A different approach is Gemara could be explained as follows. The Rabbi Zechariah bin Avkulas humility destroyed our house, burned the Echal, exiled us from our land. Because although humility is one of those traits, one of the most important traits, if not the most important trait that a person can acquire, there's also a harmful kind of humility. That's when one doesn't believe in his ability to pray and, and his own self-value and his self-worth before God. Why should I pray? God's not going to listen to me. Why should I even call out to him? Who am I? I'm not one of the rabbis. I'm just an average Joe Schmo. I go to I go to work, I come back home. Who am I to pray? That's a job for the Chachamim. That's a job for the, the Torah scholars. They should pray, not me. It's a harmful kind of humility. Of Zechariah knew with his Ruach HaKodesh that the Bet HaMikdash will be destroyed, but he didn't believe that he and the rest of Klal Yisrael can annul that decree with their tefilot. He was exceedingly humble. And he didn't appreciate the greatness of Bnei Israel and their close relationship with HaKadosh Baruch Hu. That misplaced humility ultimately destroyed the Bet HaMidash. It is told in Sefer Yirmiyahu, Yirmiyahu Navi told Sitkiyahu HaMelech the following, Hashem says if you will go out to the officers of the king of Babel to make peace treaty with them, the city of Yerushalayim will not be burned and you and your family will live. This is what the prophet told King Zitkiyahu. But if you will not go with them, this city will be conquered. They will burn it in fire and you will not survive. 
Again, the commentators on these psukim ask, since the decree of Yerushalayim was already sealed in heaven, then how could Tzidkiyahu's going to the officers actually help? What is Yirmiyahu actually telling Tzidkiyahu? And the answer is, humility annuls all harsh decrees. If Tzidkiyahu had surrendered humbly before the officers of Babel, it would have protected Klal Yisrael and the Bet HaMikdash wouldn't be destroyed. And now that we've seen that the destruction of both Batei Mikdash came as a result because the Jewish people didn't pray, we understand that it's tefillah only at this moment that has the ability to rebuild the third Bet HaMikdash. A person should think about how, due to our many sins, Eretz Yisrael, while under our control, but still not yet under total control, we still have our enemies living within us, it should break our heart. It should, it should cause us to shout out to our Kadosh Baruch Hu, We deserve the land. We deserve the building of the Bet HaMidash. We deserve Hara Moriah. And then Hashem will quickly accept our tefilot. The Bet HaMidash is already built. We're going to get to that later. It's ready in heaven. It's up there. We only have to request for it to come down. That's why the Bet HaMidash is called Devir Betecha. We say that in the bracha of Retze in Amida, Udvir Betecha, Ishe Israel. Dvir Betecha is from Lashon Dibur. Dibur is speech. We have to ask Hashem to build the Bet Amidash, and that's going to bring the redemption quicker. When the Bet Amidash stood, many brachot came to Bnei Israel even before they asked for it. But after this destruction, nothing good comes to the world without tefillah. The Rokeach writes, from the day that the Bet HaMikdash was destroyed, HaKadosh Baruch Hu doesn't even give goodness and kindness without tefillah. It's only through tefillah. In fact, if you pay attention to the Haftarah this morning, which described the Churban, among the descriptions that is written in Yirmiyahu, it states, en anavim ba-gefen, ve'en te'enim ba-te'ena. There are no grapes on the vines, no figs on the fig tree. The lack of fruit seems to be something so trivial if you think about it. You know, mass murders going on, devastation of the Churban, blood spilling in the streets, beheadings. And the Prophet is talking about there's no grapes on the tree, there's no figs on the fig tree. What's going on over here? So maybe what the Pasuk is trying to teach us is that in the post Churban era, where we are right now, even fruit doesn't grow without tefillah. When Shlomo HaMelech was king, we know it's written in Sefer Melachim, Ish tachat gafno ve'ish tachat enato. The opposite. Every person sat under his vine and fig tree. Because through the influence of Korbanot, everyone possessed the grapes and the figs and all of their needs. Anything that they needed, they had in abundance. But now, after the Churban, everything only comes through tefillah. The avodah of tefillah is all that we have left in Galut because we can't bring the korbanot. Therefore, we have to pray with humility. We have to pray with our head down, without rushing, with concentration. Fortunate are those who cry and have a broken heart when they pray, for such tefillot will certainly be answered. You know, the halakha is very clear in Shulchan Aruch that when a person prays Amidah, he has to pray with his eyes closed. And if he's reading, the Ramah says, and if he's reading from a Sidur, he's got to be looking down. Unfortunately, many people, they're looking up, they're looking around, they're wondering, they're staring at their phone, they're looking at their watch, the, the clock in front of them, the lights on the ceiling. Where's the concentration? Where's the broken heart? Where's the feeling and emotion during our tefillah? Sakota be'anan necha me'avor tefillah. Woe to us, the Megillah Techa said, we read this morning. A cloud obscures your tefillah, preventing the tefillot from going up. This cloud comes as a result of our forbidden speech, primarily, Chachamim say, for our speaking during tefillah. However, if a person prays tearfully and with concentration, his tefillah is able to rise up the ranks. It can elevate all the tefillot from the previous years of your life that were weak and may have not have had the strength to go up. And with the tefillah and the kavanah, and with a person's tears, those tefillot will go up. They will bring us goodness and blessing. Interesting that we read recently in Parashat Pinhas, or the end of Parashat Balak, 
that Pinchas was able to stop an entire Magifa with his Tefilot. The Pasuk says in Tehilim, Vayamod Pinchas Vaypalel Vateatzar HaMagifa Vatechashev Litzaka Ledor Vador Adolam. Pinchas stood up and prayed and the plague ceased. The Gemara says, by the way, that the fact that the Pasuk writes, Pinchas stood up, Amad, that's why we call Tefillah Amida from this Pasuk. And because of this prayer, he was accredited for this good deed forever. Pinchas was rewarded a Brit Shalom that was going to last for his, to his entire family. Le'olam va'ed, and Pinchas we know, Zeliyahu Navi who never died. Wonderful question was asked. Aharon HaKohen also stopped the Magifa. The Pasuk says in Sefer Bamidbar, Vayiten et haketoret, Vayichaper al ha'am, Vayamod ben ha'metim ben ha'chaim, Vateatzar ha'magifa. He placed a ketoret and it atoned for the entire nation and all those, and it was between the deceased and the living and the plague stopped. So the question is asked, why wasn't Aaron also rewarded forever? Why was it just Pinchas who was rewarded le'olam va'ed? And the answer says that he fared Shlomo because Aaron brought a korban. Aaron brought ketoret. Ketoret, no question, is one of the holiest, if not the holiest form of korbanot that we can bring. But Pinchas thought to himself and said, what will the generations after me do when there aren't korbanot? How will Bnei Israel survive then when there is no ketoret and there is no korban ola or korban shelamim? So therefore, what did Pinchas do? He prayed. He prayed. Vayamod Pinchas vayipalel. Something that can be done in all generations. And therefore, he was rewarded for all generations. Le'olam va'ed forever. Chafetz Chaim says, all the many tzarot that befall us during Galut, they're all here because we're not shouting to God in prayer. If we prayed, our tefilot would certainly take effect. Midrash writes in Shemot that when your forefathers, our forefathers, were enslaved in Mitzrayim, Kadosh Baruch Hu says, didn't I save them because of the tefilot? Pasuk writes, Vayanehu b'nei Yisrael min avodah v'izaku. B'nei Yisrael shouted out. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu, because of their work, and HaKadosh Baruch Hu brought the redemption. HaKadosh Baruch Hu says to the Jewish people, be cautious with your tefilah. There's nothing greater. She'en midat tova emena. It's greater than all the korbanot. Even if a person isn't worthy, that I should answer his prayer and do chesed with him. Since he prayed a lot, I will do chesed with him. So what does it mean for us? Well, first of all, it means we have to pray even for ourselves. Like I said before, it shouldn't be something that is just left to the tzaddikim. Someone once relayed his rabbi all of his problems. And he went to his rabbi, he goes, Rabbi, I need you to pray for me. I need, I need your help. I need you to pray for me. I have so many issues I can't find a spouse. You know, I have Parnassah issues. My back's hurting. Everything. He, all of his problems he listed one by one. So Rabbi told him, did you pray? So the man says, smart. Guy was a smart guy. He said, he quoted the Gemara in Bab Masechet Bab Batra. He says, Kol chole betoch beto, yelech etzel chacham alav rachamim. Whoever, whoever has an ill person at his home or something that's bothering him, He's, he's, he has a lot of problems. You should go to the Chacham. You should go to the Rabbi. And he should pray for him. So that's what I'm doing, Rabbi. I'm here in front of you. So the Rabbi replied to him. He says, you didn't read the Gemara right. I say the Gemara is saying two things. First, you got to go to the Chacham and ask him to pray. But the last three words is, Vivakesh alav rachamim. He should pray for himself too. You are not exempt from your own tefillah. Just because I'm going to pray for you, it doesn't mean that you can't pray for yourself. The Meiri on this Gemara says, Yelech etzel chacham vilamed hemenu darkea tefillah vivakesh rachamim. The Meiri says, you're not going to the chacham just to sit there and watch him pray for you and you just sit back and do nothing. The opposite, you got to go to him in order to learn how to pray. The pass of tefillah, what do I need to do? Watch him concentrate. Watch him focus. Watch the tears drip down his eyes. That's what you need to watch. That's what you need to learn. And then you go back home and do it for yourself. So you'll know how to pray for yourself. And although it's a great thing to have tzaddikim pray for you, 
don't forget that you also have the power of tefillah. In fact, the Noam Elimelech writes that since your tefillot come from the depths of the heart, your tefillot actually can be more influential than the tefillot of the tzaddikim. The tzaddik, he, 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 he's there with you, but it's not yourself. It's not coming from your heart. Recently, we decided in our synagogue that when it comes time for Peti Echal, and we do the Misha Berach for the Cholim, that I pause, the rabbi pauses, and every person inserts the name of the chole. I remember when we instituted this, for many reasons, a person came up to me and says, Rabbi, why can't I give you the name and you recite the name? You know, I want, I want you to recite the name. You know, why? Uh... And I answered him, similar to what we're saying here. I said, who knows the chole better? Me or you? You're giving me a name. I could recite the name. And with, with simha, and whatever could do to help for sure. But who knows the chole better? Who is it coming from the heart more? It's your relative. It's your family member. It's your close friend. You feel it more. So therefore, when you say the name, that name of that person who's close to you, it has so much more meaning, says the Noam Eli Melech. It comes from the depths of your heart. And therefore, by you reciting the name during that pause, will pierce the heavens for sure much more than if I was to recite the name. This is what he said. The tzaddikim have the ability to draw the parnasah with their pure word, pure word. So therefore you have the ability, says the Noam Eli Melech, to draw from the depths of your heart, rising to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Someone told the Rebbe of Kutsk, the Kutsk Rebbe, all about his sarot. And again, the Rebbe asked, do you pray? And the man said, Rabbi, I have so many problems I'm not even able to pray. So the Kutzka Rebbe said, musingly, he said, so why do you tell me all of your other problems and you leave out your main problem? Your inability to pray, says the Kutzka Rebbe, is the greatest problem that you have. You should have told me about that problem first. A granddaughter of a Holocaust survivor once related the following story. That during the war... She was separated from her family and was deported to Auschwitz. And she told over how on Tisha B'Av, the Nazis, Yemach Shemam B'Zichram, forced them to sit on sharp stones and had them listen to a musical concert. They did this to break their spirit because they couldn't even mourn on Tisha B'Av. They're going 365 days of mourning, but the day that they have to mourn and they want to mourn, they can't. They're purposely playing music. This woman was so upset with the Chilul Hashem. She looked up to Shamaim and prayed to HaKadosh Baruch Hu and said, don't answer me for my honor and not for the honor of your nation. Answer me for your honor, which is being disgraced by the Goyim. And I pray, God, that it begin to rain right now. The skies were clear, but shortly after this tefillah, dark clouds covered the sky. It began to pour buckets. That The musicians ran inside to store their instruments to protect them from getting damaged. And then everyone returned to their barracks. She said that at that moment, it gave her a lot of chizuk, for she saw that even there in Auschwitz, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Listen to her tefillot. So what do we have to do? How do we pray for the Geula? How do we pray for Mashiach? For the rebuilding of the Bet HaMikdash? The answer is simple. We have a bracha every single day in our Shmona Esrei. The 14th bracha of the Amidah is the bracha of Tishkon Betoch Yerushalayim. This exactly is the bracha where we pray for the rebuilding of Yerushalayim. I saw some wonderful chidushim in the book, The Amidah, written by Rabbi Eliyahu Mansur, we all know, that I want to share with you on how maybe we can just put a little bit more focus on this blessing. And we can all do our part to help bring the Bet HaMikdash back. This Beracha, we pray for the rebuilding of the Bet HaMikdash. And we know that that will herald the, the arrival of the, the Messianic era, Mashiach, Tzitkenu. And the end of all the Jewish people's troubles. Says Rabbi Mansur, maybe because of this, 
this could be the most important bracha of the whole Amidah. Because if God fulfills this request of us, we now have the solution to all of our own personal problems and as well the hardships that face all of the Jewish community around the world. Can our generation be worthy of the Bet HaMikdash? Chachamim tell us that the third Bet HaMikdash will differ fundamentally from the first two. Whereas the first two Bet HaMikdash were built by human laborers, the third Bet HaMikdash is built by God in the heavens. B'nai Israel proclaim, Mikdash Adonai Konenu Yadecha in Az Yashir Moshe. The temple that your hands Hashem has built. And our rabbis tell us that this refers to the third Bet HaMikdash, which will be built by God and not by people. In fact, it's being built as we speak currently. Every prayer that we recite for the rebuilding of the Bet HaMikdash, every mitzvah that we perform, any good deed that we act upon, contributes to that building effort. The Gemara writes that anyone who celebrates, for example, the mitzvah of Chatan Vekala, who celebrates with a bride and groom at their wedding, is credited with building one of the ruins of Jerusalem. Now while it may be difficult to find a connection between the Chatan and Kala and the ruins of Jerusalem, that may remain unclear. But one thing that doesn't remain unclear, through the Gemara's comment that we could build the temple through our mitzvot, that's clear. If I celebrate mitzvot, simchat, chatan vekala, I'm actually helping to rebuild the Bet HaMikdash. How many truckloads of material is required to do any renovation in our personal homes or outside our homes? But every mitzvah that we perform is yet another truck, is now another vehicle transporting all these things, materials to the construction site in, in Shamayim in heaven. The building project is well, well underway, thanks to all the mitzvot that we've been doing for the last almost 2,000 years, advancing the construction, the process of building the Bet HaMikdash. And this answers a very basic question that a lot of us have, people's minds think about this all the time, is can Mashiach really come in our lifetime? If the Bet HaMikdash wasn't, dis- wasn't built during the period of the great Sadiqim, can you imagine the Rambam, Rashi, the Ramban, the period of the Rishonim, Rabbi Uda, Levi, they never saw the Bet HaMikdash. The time of the Tanaim, the Amoraim, or the Rishonim, again, how could we be so arrogant to think that we're deserving of the Temple's rebuilding? And the answer is simple. Each generation, every individual, has contributed to the building project, like we said. And no question that the time of the Rishonim, the Amoraim, the Geonim, the Savoraim, they, they contributed tremendous amounts to that building. But we make contributions of our own. Every mitzvah brings us closer to that desired goal. And there's only a small bit left to do. And we, through our mitzvot, are able to realize that goal. And through it, bring the, bring the Bet HaMidash closer. Tishkon betoch Yerushalayim. Ircha ka'asher dibarta. That's how the bracha begins. Reside in your city, Yerushalayim, as you said. The Gemara Masechet Ta'anit states that there's a heavenly city in Jer- uh, of Jerusalem parallel to the city of Yerushalayim here on earth. And we pray that God take residence in the heaven, the Jerusalem of heaven, your city, Jerusalem, your city, which will prepare us for the second final stage where the Shekhinah's revelation will be in the earthly city. In Sefer Vayikra, HaKadosh Baruch Hu warns us, Vashimoti et mikdeshechem, I shall lay your sanctuary desolate. The Chachamim inferred from this Pasuk that even in the state of Shemama, even in the state of desolation, the temple is still called Mikdash. It's still holy meaning it still retains its status of Kedusha, of sanctity. And that's why it's halachically prohibited to walk on Harabait, on Temple Mount today, despite the absence of the Bet HaMikdash. And although there are Jews that do walk on Harabait, they have other reasons to do so. But for the 
most Faradim hold it's prohibited because of this pasuk v'ashimoti ed mikdashechem. It's still a mikdash even when desolate. The site of the Bet Hamikdash remains holy, even though our enemies constructed their own mosques and their own places of worship on it. So therefore, we ask Hakadosh Baruch Hu tishkon betoch Yerushalayim that He should maintain His presence in Yerushalayim, even though we're in our current state of exile. We add ka'asher dibarta, like you said, like you told us in Parashat in Sefer Vayikra, referring to that pasuk v'ashimoti mikdashechem, where you indicated to us God that. He would remain present in Yerushalayim even in the state of destruction. The next statement in, that pas- in, the, in the bracha of Tishkon is one that is a little bit difficult to understand. You may have had this question as well. We say, David avdecha mehera betocha tachin, And speedily establish the throne of your servant David in its midst. During the time of the Arizal, there were those who argued that this sentence shouldn't be in this bracha. It shouldn't be in the bracha of Tishkon Betoch Yerushalayim. They noted that the theme of the next bracha, Etzemach David Avdecha, that the throne, the King David's reign, that's the theme of the next bracha. And therefore it would make sense that this line of Kiseh David Avdecha Mera Betocha Tachin be found in the next bracha. Because this one, Tishkon, speaks about the building of the Bet HaMikdash, it doesn't relate to the, the theme of, of the Davidic dynasty. In fact, it was a story brought down of a man who came to the Arizal. And the Arizal had this custom of looking at the people's foreheads and telling them what's wrong with them. And the Arizal looked at this man's forehead and he immediately recognized that he didn't pray properly. And he asked the man the following question. Did you omit this sentence? Did you leave out this sentence of Ekiseh David Avdecha Meira Betocha Tachin from the Amidah? And the man answered, Yes, I did. I believe that it should be in the next bracha. He was part of that group. So Arizal says, I was able to see that on your forehead. And you should know that you didn't pray Amidah properly your entire life. So the question then comes up, Why do we add this clause? Why do we add this sentence of Tishkon Betoch Yerushalayim? So the Arizal says that this bracha is not mentioning David. It's mentioning Kise David. Kise David means David's throne. And the Arizal says, this is in reference to Mashiach ben Yosef. It's in reference to the Mashiach of the tribe of Yosef who will come and lay the groundwork prior to the arrival of Mashiach ben David, who was a descendant of David HaMelech, which will reinstate the Jewish dynasty. Achach Hamim tell us that there's a possibility, unfortunately, that Mashiach ben Yosef will be killed by Armilus, the enemy of the Jewish people, while he fulfills his mission. And therefore, when we pray here for the restoration of the Bet HaMikdash, we pray as well for Kiseh David. We're praying for Mashiach ben Yosef, who will prepare the throne of David HaMelech. So we, we, we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu to protect Mashiach ben Yosef from Armilus HaRasha during those events that will take place preceding the building of the Bet HaMikdash. In fact, if you have a good Sidur, it will tell you that when you get to that, that line, Bekiseh David Abdecha Merab Tochat Achin, to have in mind that HaKadosh Baruch Hu spare uh, Mashiach ben Yosef during that war. Bimhera beyamenu. Uvne ota binyan olam bimhera beyamenu. Build it as an eternal structure speedily in our days. We've used this term all the time. Mashiach will come. I don't know if there's any rabbi in the world who doesn't end his speech with Bimerabiyamenu. Bimerabiyamenu, the simple meaning of this phrase is we want to see the Bet Amigdash. We want to see Mashiach now in our days while we are alive. That's when we want to see him. We don't want to come back. We want to see him today. But maybe we could say, beautiful Chidush by Rabbi Mansur that the meaning of Bimerabi Yamenu is that the temple will be rebuilt as a result of Yamenu, as a result of our days. What does this mean? The way we spend our days. The Zohar teaches that the righteous Sadiqim fill their day with Torah and Mitzvot. They don't squander even a minute of their day. Every single moment they utilize 
They don't squander one opportunity to study Torah or perform mitzvot or do chesed. The day rises and sets and they look back and they do cheshbon nefesh at the end of their day and they say, I got everything done. I didn't waste a moment. And HaKadosh Baruch Hu stores these days. And all of these full days, Shlemud, God stores them in a bank, in a treasure chest, in Shamayim. And when the tzaddik dies, Ad Me'ab all of those days, of complete days of Kedusha, are brought to him and they form a special clothing, a garment for his Neshama. And the Zohar concludes by warning the people who do the opposite, that those who waste their day on vanity, who waste their day on shtuyot, of just doing nothing and just staring around, looking at their clock, will have no clothing for their souls in the afterlife. Time, Rabotai, we know, is our most precious commodity. And the Chachamim, the Tzadikim, the righteous ones among us, are wise enough to fill their time with meaningful and constructive pursuits rather than squandering it. The Torah describes Avraham Avinu as Avraham Zaken Ba Bayamim. He was coming with his days. Abraham left the world accompanied by his days because every day he lived, he joined his neshama to testify the proper use of his time here on earth. Abraham Avinu didn't squander any moment. Nothing was wasted. It was all devoted to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. Rabbi Mantur in his Sefer brings a nice mashal to explain the concept. He says there are two types of calendars you can buy in a store in the times before they had smartphones. One type of calendar you can buy is that you tear off each day as it passes. And the other type of calendar is a complete calendar where each day's page remains. And the person just simply turns to the next page or the next month. And one of the rabbis on this mashal commented that it's far preferable to purchase the second kind. Because we don't believe that the day is torn. We don't believe that the day that passes is simply discarded and thrown away and never thought of again. For Am Yisrael, the Jewish people, each day has eternal value because of what we accomplish in that day. It's not torn off. It stays with us forever. Assuming, and only assuming that we use it productively. So we ask HaKadosh Baruch Hu that He should rebuild the Bet HaMikdash Be'yamenu through our days, through our proper use of time, as we conclude this beracha, we acknowledge that the restoration of the Bet HaMikdash depends largely on Yamenu, on our days. Right now, what are we doing right now during Tisha B'Av? Are we just looking around, looking at our watch, waiting for it to be done? Or Baruch Hashem, we have over 30 people here listening words of Torah. Thousands of people logged in online. Today, Torah anytime, I Torah, one after another, full days of getting chizuk, of inspiration. It's called using the time wisely. In fact, Chacham ben Sion, Abba Shaul, Zecher Tzadik Livracha, he always noted how people complain on fast days about the length of the day. Oh, this is too long, this is great. You know, maybe we should only do a half day fast. These, these sunrise to sunset, oh, Tisha Be'av Yom Kippur, 25 hours, how are we going to do this? It's too long. Apparently, he says, the days are long. No question, the days long, 25 hours. It's not easy to fast for 25 hours. But if the days are long for fasting, that means the days are long for us to study. And then the days are long to work through portions of our Torah, to devote time for our, to our families. The days are long to visit the sick patients in the hospital. The days are long to volunteer for communal needs, and so on and so forth. People complain that they don't have enough time. But this is because so much time is wasted on vanity. It's by using our time constructively for meaningful, valuable purposes that we become worthy of our Geulah and the restoration of the Bet HaMikdash. And how does the Bracha conclude? Baruch Atah Hashem Bonei Yerushalayim. Blessed are you God who builds Yerushalayim. We don't say Bana Yerushalayim. We say Bone Yerushalayim. We describe God as building in the present tense because He's building Yerushalayim in the present right now as we speak. As we already said, 
The construction of the Bet HaMikdash is already well underway. Each mitzvah that we perform, every tefillah that we recite, contributes to that process. Of course, will culminate in the descent of the completed Bet HaMikdash from the heavens to the sacred site on Haramoriyah. Rabotai, never think, never think that you can't make a difference. Never think that your words of tefillah won't count. A person has difficulty reading that's fine. Maybe just read the first Beracha, says Shuchan Aruch. Just read the first one. And then the rest you can read in English. There's so many translations of Sidurim now that a person can read and have his tefillah. And if he can't read the Amidah, if that's too long for him, just stop and pray to God and tell him what you need. And include in, those, in that tefillot of what you need. Pray for the Mashiach. Pray. Don't think that you're... Don't be too humble that... You don't think it's, 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 it's worthy enough for you. Ah, I'm not worthy enough to go pray. Don't be like that. We have so many things that we need right now. Am Yisrael is in a state of despair. There's so much anti-Semitism going on right now that we don't know what's happening. The Jews are trashing Eretz Yisrael as you've probably been following the news. Our own people are against the Jewish state. Our own people are against the Jewish people. We need tefillot now more than ever. Let us use these opportunities now, Tisha B'Av, we've got a few hours left. We know that Tisha B'Av is the Yom Tov, is the holiday. We don't recite Tachanun because this is the day Mashiach ben David is born. And we know that. Let us use every opportunity, every opportunity in our day, every moment in our day for good things. When it comes time for Tefillah, we should have more concentration. We should recite the word slowly. If it means purchasing a Sidur with English translation, then do so. If you already have one with English translation, Buy a Sidur that, that will, will show you some more Kavanot to have. Focus on every name of HaKadosh Baruch There's so many things that we can do. But at the least, at the least, when you get to the Bracha, Tishkon Betoch Yerushalayim, Kasher Dibarta, we pray to HaKadosh Baruch Hu, Kasher Dibarta, even though it's desolate, even though it's laying in ruins, dwell, HaKadosh Baruch Hu, please dwell your presence upon us. That's something that we cannot live without. And Bezat Hashem, through our Im- intense and immense tefilot, that we will continue to do, or if not even start to do from this moment, we will cause a shaking in Shamaim. Our tefilot will pierce the heavens where God will have no choice but to lay that final brick and bring down the completed temple, the Bet HaMikdash Lishi, Bimera, Be'yamenu, Amen. Wishing everyone a wonderful rest of your fast.